Uh, I'm Steve Cheney. I'm the CEO of the American Security Project. We've got our propaganda in front of you. Um, we take a bipartisan look at national security issues. Uh, we've been very active of late in a number of them, not the least of which was the law of the state convention. You might have heard the hearing yesterday uh, and various other issues. But today our highlight is having Walter Pincus here, and I want to introduce both he and Frank Lowenstein. Uh, let me lay a little ground rules out. It's with the journalists, I guess everything's got to be on the record, so um, what you say you can't attribute. Uh, after Frank gets talking and Walter, then we'll have a QA. and uh, The same rules apply. Just raise your hand and we'll, we'll try to pick on you. Uh, if you would please have a question instead of a lecture, we would appreciate it. Um, I, I can't resist being a Marine sitting next to two Yale graduates and two lawyers. Um, offering a short joke, and some may know that I was Dick Cheney's Deputy Executive Secretary many years ago, and Dick would talk about when he was running for office, he had been elected in the House and he was running for re-election, went to Frontier Days in Cheyenne, Wyoming, walked up to a cowhand, said, hi, I'm Dick Cheney and uh, I'm running for the House, and the cowhand turned to him and said, thank God we've got a real fool in there right now. <laughs> of, course, of course, that was Dick. but. Um, uh, I am not related, but I did have a good time in the Secretary of Defense's office. Uh, today we're privileged to have Frank Lowenstein with us. Frank, who don't, don't know, I, I know you don't put in your bio, but he's a Yale grad. He's got a law degree from Boston College. Uh, he was a foreign policy advisor for Senator Kerry and staff director on the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, and he's now a principal with the Podesta Group. And he'll do a little more lengthy introduction of Walter. Um, but, of course, Walter's a Yale grad, Georgetown Law, an Army veteran, I might add, a distinguished journalist, I think everybody here knows that. He's been recognized with dozens of awards, not the least of which is a Pulitzer, and he talks and lectures and writes frequently on defense, foreign policy, and the intelligence community. With that, I'm going to turn it over to you, Frank. Thank you very much, sir. We can hear you. Uh, thank you very much, Steve. It's really an honor to be here today. I'll, I'll just say one brief note about ASP. I remember when uh, Senator Kerry first uh, started talking about his, his desire to have a truly nonpartisan national security think tank here in Washington. And uh, I had a number of conversations with him about that and some sort of challenges we would face in, in, in scaling organizational this and that. I just have to say it's been an extraordinary success and thanks in, in, in large measure to and to listen to you, Steve, and all the folks in the ASP team. So, um, it's truly just a fantastic effort and I'm very proud to be here uh, today. Uh, I'll, I'll not spend a lot of time introducing uh, Walter, who, who truly needs no introduction. Um, I will list a couple of his awards, which are obviously two awards to uh, go into great detail on. But uh, he did win the Pulitzer Prize, part of the team of the Washington Post. Um, he won the George Polk Award. Uh, he won an Emmy for writing a CBS documentary on strategic nuclear weapons. And in 2010, he won the Arthur Ross Award from the American Academy for Diplomacy for his columns on foreign policy. What I can say from my time on the Hill and from working on national security issues is there was no more authoritative voice on these issues than Walter Pinkus. He was always, when we, when we talked about getting getting reporters who were influential to, to help us make the case, Walter was always at the top of the list. And I think he did a tremendously a lot of tremendously good work on the Star Treaty and helping us to move that along. And, and really making the case more broadly for a, for a sensible national security policy that is uh, as far removed as it possibly can be from partisan politics, which is really the mission of ASP, why it's so critical to be here today. But also something that Senator Kerry cares greatly about, and those of us who have been involved in these issues know that uh, there's nothing more important than depoliticizing these so we can have a sensible debate uh, about what's in our national security interests. So without further ado, I will uh, I'll turn it over to Walter, and then we'll, we'll go to hearing your questions. I've got to put this thing down my throat. That's the way I talk. Um, well, I appreciate being here. I appreciate all of you being here. I have a terrible habit of not going to these events when the reporters are talking. We're all derivative. So, um, I just worry about that. Uh, I thought I'd just start off by saying uh, the last two years of this kind of, uh, I hate to think, 40 some odd years of writing uh, have been different because the Post suddenly gave me a column uh, twice a 
hours a week. And uh, it's different to some degree from what I did because uh, what I was always trying to do when I was writing uh, news stories is uh, find something, issues that aren't being covered right and try to lay the facts out associated with those issues. Um, part of my past, which attracts some of my Franks, is uh, one of the big influences on, on my career, if not the biggest, uh, was twice in the 1960s. Uh, I spent 18 months uh, on a sabbatical each time, uh, running investigations for Senator Fulbright and the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. Uh, it's so long ago now, I'm sort of frightened about it. Uh, but I had written a magazine piece on foreign government lobbying in 1960. And in 1962, uh, the chairman called me up and said the committee was interested in foreign government lobbying effects on the AID program. And would I, I'd exposed the weaknesses in this magazine piece. Uh, did I want to change the law? And I was uh, all 28 years old unattached, and so I was writing for three North Carolina papers and freelancing. So I went to the committee for 18 months to run an investigation for Senator Fulbright. It, um, I'll spend a couple minutes because it's so different from today. If you ran an investigation for Senator Fulbright, it was you and a lawyer, just two people. That was the staff. And you had six months to investigate. During those six months, you had to find out all the facts. You had to make a judgment of what was right and wrong. And your lawyer had to draw up amendments, in this case, to the Foreign Agent Registration Act, and set a schedule for hearings to support what you found in those hearings in order to get the amendments passed. And you did that in the first six months. At the end of six months, she sat down with the senator and, and Senator Hickenlooper, who was the ranking Republican, and went over what you had. And then uh, you laid out a hearing schedule, and you did hearings, one at a time, with ten different lobbyists for each of the amendments that we had to the law. By the time we got to about the fourth, and the hearings were in closed session, before every hearing, you had to give the committee a two-page memo on what the hearing was to accomplish, and you gave the chairman a stack of questions. And the chairman asked all the questions. And then any member who wanted to ask would ask him, but it was fairly well done. And by the time we got to the fourth lobbyist, who was a good friend of three of the senators on the committee, uh, and also very close to Edward Dirksen. Uh, the chairman called me up one day and said he wanted to take me over to see Dirksen. Dirksen wanted to talk about the upcoming hearing in which his friend, the lobbyist, was to testify. And we went in, and before we went in, the senator said to me, one, you're not to say a word. Two, you're not to show any emotion. And <coughs> three, just sit and wait. And we went in, the chairman gave Dirksen our amendments. Dirksen gave the amendments to his uh, legislative assistant who walked out to review them. The senator and Dirksen then made idle talk. His, uh, Dirksen's aide came back and said, they're fine with us. Dirksen talked to the senator and said, Bill, I guess we don't need to call X. And, and Senator Fulbright, without a, a stopping for a minute, said, well, if we're up to me, uh, I could see not doing that, but this fellow here is going to go back to journalism, and if we don't hold the hearings the way he wants, he's going to write about it, <laughs> and we'll all get in trouble, so we're just going to have to go ahead and do it, and we did. <laughs> uh, it's not the only time we did it. I came back. 
I promised to come back five years later to do an investigation of military and foreign policy. Uh, in 69 and 70, which turned out to be investigation of the war. Uh, but the same thing happened with Kissinger. Uh, we got into a fight over who's going to testify and all the rest. And he did the same thing on the phone with Kissinger. Everybody underestimated Bill Fulbright's sophistication and political sense. But that was a great lesson. And that's stuck with me. The other lesson was finding out that about 90% of people who work in government or more are trying to do the right thing. And that I learned within the first week how little journalists knew about what was going on inside government. And that's also stuck with me. So uh, I consider that one of the great lessons. Then the other lucky thing for me is I went to work for the Post and they, um, starting in 66 or 69, and then I came back in 75 again, uh, have let me write what I want to write about. Um, so I've been a very lucky person in journalism and, and tried essentially, as I said, to write factual stories about <coughs> issues that didn't seem to be covered uh, well enough. And then two years ago, the column came along and it gave me an opportunity not just to write facts I think that are being missed, but also put them in some kind of context. Um, and that's been a lot of fun. It's, it, it comes at a time, I also have been teaching a course at Stanford called Oversight of Government. Stanford has a very great Washington program in which they get 24 <coughs> students in for 14 weeks give them jobs during the day in government, uh, on the Hill or in uh, the administration or NGOs. And then they take two courses, three if they want. And so I've taught this course that I started up at Yale called Oversight of Government and the Media, but I always teach them the media is not doing very much oversight. We have become a kind of common carrier, which is my complaint about my own profession. Um, and, and you get some insight, and they get insight. And I teach them their 14 weeks to give some more knowledge of really what goes on than any reporter gets in 40 years. Uh, the only other point I'll make, which I make with them, and which I, I thoroughly believe, is that we have turned into a PR society in which it's essentially government by PR. And that is, if you can sell it, you can do it. If you can't sell it, you won't get it. And as bad as that seems, we have also reached a point now where people in public life say anything, whether it's factual or not. And if you repeat it often enough, it becomes a fact. Uh, and I think the press doesn't understand that well enough. So that our job is really to try to break through uh, what's become a PR society. Uh, and the printed press is really the only way um, you can do it. It's magazines and print television. Uh, I spent 12 <coughs> years in television and believe it is an enormously powerful uh, vehicle for you. <coughs> it is head it's a headline service. And that's what the internet has. When they introduced the internet at the paper, everybody was saying, oh, now you can put your notes on and write as long as you want and all the rest of it. The fact is that news websites, and the reason I have all of them, I'm also half owned by the corporation, so I have a contract to write for the paper. I work for the corporation about where we're going in electronic Europe. So I've studied it, and, and news websites only are used between 10.30, have an audience, between 10.30 and 3.30. And they peak at noon. The average time on a news site uh, is four minutes for Yahoo and Google and those people. It is nine minutes for the Post, and it's 11 or 12 minutes for the Times. So essentially, we can have 
2,000 word stories, 10,000 word stories, but the fact is that most <coughs> people who look at it are looking at it for a short time and looking at it for headlines. And I'm so old fashioned, Twitter and all that stuff is just nonsense. <laughs> um, so why don't I I'll sort of end it there and let you pick up on any subject you want to ask me about. Great, thank you very much, Walter. I'll start, if I could, just with a question that I think uh, is on a lot of our minds now and one that, that really goes to the intersection of, of policy and politics, and that is the negotiations of Iran over its nuclear program, uh, which are ongoing now, and I know you've written very thoughtfully on this recently. I, I think the question that I have uh, at the forefront of my mind is, if we were to come up with a sensible solution on this, a negotiated solution, it would probably involve allowing Iran to continue to enrich Iran. I don't think it's realistic that they would cease all uranium production right now. I think that issue will, if that is indeed the case, I, I think the Israelis will have reservations about it, and I think that, that there will be folks on the Hill who, who are actively to potentially use this as a political issue. I, I think in the presidential campaign as well, uh, Governor Romney, and I, I've been on the other side of this in Senator Kerry's campaign in 2004, so I understand how it works. So they'll be looking for any opportunity to betray the Obama administration as we, especially when it comes to dealings with Iran. So what I'd be interested in hearing your thoughts on is, is it possible to depoliticize uh, any potential negotiated settlement with the Iranians on, on their nuclear program? And, and if so, how can, how can we all help with that effort? Uh, the short answer is no. Okay, uh, next question. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I have to admit that, that uh, in, in the seminar I teach, the last seven sessions are all, how would you oversee a certain subject? And actually, the subject we're looking at is the Iran nuclear program and how you would oversee it, either from an administration point of view or from the Hill point of view. And so I've had a whole series of speakers coming in and talking about it. The beauty of teaching the Stanford course is people who are involved in the policy somehow decide they want to come in and talk to a bunch of 15 undergraduates. So they're good sessions. And I, it's something I've thought about a fair amount. And I think, uh, as I said, this is not something that can be settled in an election period. Because no matter what the settlement is, if it leaves uh, the current regime in power in Iran, it's going to be a failure from the point of view of the opposition to Obama. Uh, any solution that's logical is going to have, it's another thing I learned from Fulbright. You, you, both parties who are on opposite sides of a political situation internationally have to get something out of whatever the negotiation is. There cannot be a winner and a loser. It's got to be win-win on both sides. Hamidi's got his own problems. I mean, he's dealing with the great state. One reason they have remained in power is because of our actions toward them. We're dealing with a regime that we spent 10 years saying we're going to change. I mean, how do, what do you think they think of us? Um, I went through this on Tuesday night, so it's old hat. Most people forget when we talk about regime change, we've done it. We did it in the 50s and we don't remember, but boy, they do. And so that is an issue. Uh, so they don't see us as acting in good faith, and of course we don't see them as acting in good faith. So between those poles, if you're going to reach some kind of understanding, you're going to have to let them, as they say, uh, enrichment is allowed under the treaty, and they're going to have to come away with some form of enrichment. So there has to be some kind of compromise, and, and given our politics today, I don't think President Obama can, can compromise in any way that isn't taken badly by the opposition. So I think you're going to have attempts, as they're doing now, for some kind of small steps to, as confidence-building measures, even in the best instance. Uh, 
I think all that's going to take time. And the longer time it takes, the more you're going to see the opposition saying uh, the Iranians are just jerking us around, and meanwhile they are uh, increasing their enrichment and they are closer and closer to getting involved. The one thing I think that's off the table is the Israeli attack uh, militarily. It always was a silly idea, and done as much, I think, by Netanyahu uh, for his own political purposes. Again, it's a, it's a one of the first things Fulbright told me um, was, if you don't understand the domestic problems of the countries you're dealing with, you can't have a foreign policy. Because all foreign policy <coughs> is domestic. And so it suits Netanyahu's purposes. Uh, what people here don't understand is how much of a buildup militarily we have been going through. And it's not publicized here. We've sent F-22s, which are our stealth fighters, not very safe to fly, but they sent them out to the Gulf, which would lead into any attack to knock out their uh, radars and uh, early defense systems. And we've sent another squadron of F-15s out there, which would be a follow-on force. People here don't know it or talk about it. The Iranians know. They know we sent a lot of ships into the Gulf, minesweepers, we've asked the British minesweepers. There's been a fair amount of visible preparation. Uh, the Iranians know that. So the threat on the table has been played out, and sanctions are beginning to cut. So there are a lot of pressures to reach some kind of agreement. But in reaching that agreement, we're going to have to give the Iranians something. And that's going to be very tough in a political situation. <clears throat> if you could just very briefly introduce yourself and then ask a question. Uh, Greg Taylor, Arms Control Association. <clears throat> Walter, you've had a lot of experience over the years reporting on, on the issues that the government says are classified. Um, and I, I wondered what your assessment is today about how the balance between protecting secrets and, uh, and, and protecting the uh, sources and methods of the government uh, are, are being weighed against the, the need of the public to know. And I had a, a, a few national intelligence estimates in mind in asking the question, you know, there was the 1999 Foreign Enlisting Missile Threat Estimate, which tended to validate the Roosevelt Commission report, created a totally unrealistic notion about the threat. There was a 2002 Iraq WMD estimate uh, there was not an estimate immediately prior to the invasion of Iraq, uh, which would have shown how the earlier estimate earlier was kind of coming in blue. Uh, and then we have the, the, the uh, 2007 estimate on Iran. The government's position now seems to be we will never again have any kind of unclassified summary. We're not going to share what we know about what's going on in the world. Where are we now in this subject? Well, I, th I think. That's the policy that came out of uh, sort of the effects of, of the published publish, uh, findings in 2007. And if you follow the arguments, uh, it was, they rushed it out. They didn't want to rewrite the findings. The findings were done for people who had followed the subject closely. And so they did what we do in the newspaper, and that is they put a lead on it, which for them was the newest thing. Uh, but it didn't undermine the idea that there was still a basic belief that enrichment was going on, etc. cetera, uh, just that they had stopped the weaponization part, of it, which gave what everybody decided was a false impression. And they felt they couldn't put it in some kind of public context because they'd be accused of rewriting uh, their findings. Uh, the short answer is NIEs never used to be made public anyway. Uh, they got leaked once they were sent to the Hill or circulated, and the people who didn't feel that they got a fair shake out of it 
let it go. This is a Washington sort of game, I think. And you never stop it. I'm, I'm different from most people. That, I mean, the stuff I get accused of, of getting through leaks, a lot of it is already published. I, mean, I think I've told the story long enough about the neutron warhead story. I mean, I, I had the first story that we were going for new, neutron, a Lance missile that was going to have a neutron warhead on it, and then artillery shells. And it wasn't a leak. It, uh, it, it was a misstatement made. They left inside a published hearing that they were going to go ahead and build enhanced radiation warhead, which was the code word for it. And I started asking around, and, uh, because I knew, uh, I learned before they had stopped doing something like that. But it was published. Everybody thought somebody leaked it to me. There was a huge leak investigation. It was published. I mean, they make mistakes if you read enough, and that's essentially uh, what I do, is I try to read as much as I can, because, particularly now more than before, because people will say almost anything. <laughs> uh, and so you really can't trust what people say. And I think you've got to start from a factual base, and so I try to find a factual base. Unlike Woodward, who gets stuff over the transom all the time, I never do. I mean, occasionally, in nine times out of ten, it's phony. Um, most of the information that people think is classified, I get from people with whom I'm having a discussion about some issue. And it comes out, and over the phone, you don't know if it's classified or not. But I think the press complains to The irony has always been to me the people who are always worried most <clears throat> about anonymous sources don't realize we did a study once because I use anonymous sources all the time. And it turns out that the section of the paper that does anonymous sources the most is a sports section. <laughs> <laughs> and the second, second most was a political paper. And they're just telling stories they don't want attributed to them to are nasty, and we're sort of dealing with subject matter. Uh, but I think all that's overdone, and I always throw in that I'm against the shield law and all that, because I think those of us who print what you obviously know it could or is classified ought to take the same kind of uh, risk that the person who told it to. First of all, to put it in the paper, it's got to be true, it's got to be relevant, it's got to be newsworthy. Um, and that's the test. And you go back to the government and ask about it. That's what we do. Um, but I, I do think, and I've been through two subpoenas and found in contempt, uh, you protect sources who give you accurate information. They're risking their next higher risk one. about the politics of foreign policy. You've watched this play out for a long time. Um, and I'm curious, the, the selling material for this event was to you know, talk about that. So are we in a very different place today when it comes to talking about foreign policy? It's more politicized than it used to be? And I have a related question, which is, given that this is the one area where polls show that President Obama out polls quite considerably, uh, Governor Romney, does it surprise you that Governor Romney seems intent upon trying to make an issue of foreign policy in spite of the fact that he is polling at a disadvantage? Um, I think Obama's opponents are trying to use whatever they can use to embarrass him in the foreign policy field. Just by a thousand cuts, and the cuts are things that are irrelevant, but they work. Uh, I, I always discuss things that are uh, metaphors or 
what I call moving facts. That there are facts that are not totally relevant, are not that important, but people understand them and they distort what you're doing. There's a big story today about Elizabeth Warren and is she or is she not 132nd India? This has nothing to do with anything. <laughs> and we make a big deal of it. Uh, if, you, if you follow the House Armed Services Committee, which I do for semi-entertainment. <laughs> and, and for information. Uh, you know, they introduced two or three amendments this past time just to embarrass the president. Um, for no other reason. The, the, my favorite, which I didn't write about, was that, they, you know, they added the money in 2010 that he projected would be needed to satisfy Senator Kyle on money for the labs, uh, which is now cut back, which everybody knew they were going to do cut back by the Republican Appropriation Committee and, and to the right number, the Republicans went back to that number and during the, hear the hearing made a big remark, made a big point about the President promised this, it ought to be done, he can't keep his promises. So you use whatever you can use, irrelevant as it may be. And our politics are as bad as I've ever seen. I mean, I haven't ever seen anything like this. Um, and again, going back to, to going back to Vietnam, I was very much involved in that. If if Senator Fulbright wanted a report from the Nixon administration that everybody knew would be negative toward supporters of the Vietnam War, you could count on the Republican Senate and even the dead, Senator Russell and Senator Stanis totally probably support getting that information because it was a Senate issue. And they were senators. They weren't pro-war, they weren't Republicans, they were senators. This is the right of the Senate. You don't see that at all. So I think we're in a new era, and how we got out of it is beyond. John Isaacs, Counsel for the World. I have a, a simple question for you. You said, I believe you're advising the Washington Post Corporation on some of the new media. And then you also cited... And I'm listening. <laughs> cited uh, statistics of how little time people spend on news websites. So what's the future of print journalism? Well, I think, I think print journalism is going to be around. What people forget is we still have a bigger newsroom than we had at Watergate. And we have less space. We have more writers that write once a week, once a month, than we ever had. Um, for years, it was hidden under the, well, we're doing accountability journalism. It takes a long time. If you work for Bradley and you spent longer than a week on a story, you were finished. And we have people spending six months in a year. Um, now, the, the, the press, the people who run press, I, I, the reason I'm a consultant of the paper is that in my youth, I was, my father owned the company and I didn't go into it, but I invested in it. And I was very lucky. I was on the board of the New York Review, it's one of their original investors. I was involved with the New Yorker as a publication. So I, I mean, I'm not a total novice at all. I just like writing and I never wanted to be an editor. Um, but it's a long way of saying that I think newspapers were started in this country essentially by businessmen who wanted to get involved in local politics or national affairs or whatever. They were never designed to make money. What happened was that when radio came along, and in the old days, the FCC required public service. News was a public service. So the first people that got <coughs> licenses were newspapers. And 
if you were, were a uh, affiliate of a network in radio, you plugged into the network, you had your own news organization anyway, because you're a newspaper, and you made 30% on advertising on your radio station. Television came along, same thing. So you then had newspapers with radio and television licenses. The affiliation in television got you 50%. So by the late 70s, early 80s, newspapers were money-making machines. And they got bought up by a big corporation. We have the biggest chain we've ever had. And that is, we used to have 90 papers, now they've got 85, got to go somewhere else. There never was a Mr. Gannett. Uh, the stock was at five at one point, went up to 95. Our stock was at 25 when we came in. It's now 380, we went up to 800. Um, it became a big money-making operation. And the only thing that dropped in the last four years faster than newsprint advertising is radio and television. So they no longer make that kind of money. But they'll exist. They'll just be smaller. You're paying more for them. But we used to have a paper that was 100 pages on Monday and 220 pages on Thursday. And people still spent 27 minutes reading it. So who's getting screwed? It's the advertising they sort of put on. Uh, but the short answer is, is print will survive. The real question is, is the readership, the careful readership going to survive? And what becomes, I mean, radio took over the first news source you had. Television uh, took over, you know, <laughs> killed Life magazine and, and all those things. Uh, it's really how much does the public absorb so that they can judge when people start talking to them about what the issues are. And I worry much more about the PR end of things. And I do good print existing. The real question is how much do people read us? And, and I guess my one other point is a newspaper is like a uh, supermarket. Uh, I like to think I'm in the meat business, but the country is becoming more vegetarian. So it's just as important that we have a good sports section, a style section works, and all the rest of it, as it is the things that we do. Thanks. Well, I'll just say very briefly on behalf of the whole group, if you have any stock tips. <laughs> Facebook. Facebook. <laughs> I think essentially they've become political vehicles. That you investigate what suits your party and you don't otherwise. I mean, I was teaching oversight of government when the Bush administration controlled everything and there was no oversight. It's a very, um, it's an unused tool, but I think like everything, it's it's now run by politics. Uh, my name is Stephanie Dreyer, I'm the meteorologist director for the Truman National Security Project. Uh, thank you for being here. Uh, you said that we live in a PR society that is increasingly driven by what sells. And so I think that we're starting to see internal strategy now being publicized. For example, the administration 
publicizing how they went in and got Osama bin Laden and uh, documentation of how he got Chang Wen Chang out of China, uh, Navy SEALs writing books and being in, in TV series and movies. movies uh, and I was just wondering, uh, you know, does this undermine the United States' trustworthiness uh, or ability to work covertly, and does this impact our national security as a whole? No, I, I think uh, when it comes to the agency and, and things like that, they just go ahead with their business. It, it's how whoever is in the White House and wherever is up on the Hill wants to use that material. Uh, I always worry when people worry about our trustworthiness. It, it always came up when uh, it was leaked that we had, I mean, leaked or it turned out somebody had a spy here and, or we couldn't be trusted. We would write about a spy or something like that. Um, it really never changed anything. The, the intelligence community, the best I know, and I'm an outsider. Everybody thinks I know what the hell's going on. Uh, I really don't. It's whatever people tell me, uh, and I can somehow verify. But the little bit I know is the intelligence agencies develop relationships with other intelligence agencies, same way we do. And the trustworthiness is based on personal relationships rather than what's published in print. But, I mean, that's my outsider's view. I, again, I don't know what's going on. Larry Corp, the Center for American Farmers. I'd like to raise two issues that I guess you dealt with more when you were a reporter. The emphasis by newspapers of things to get two sides of an issue, even where there are two sides. And the other is identifying people. Larry Gore from the liberal list, or, you know, I, I've been at AEI, yeah, I've been at Brookings. It, rather than what Larry or Chris or John or Greg says. I mean, what, how did that come about? Uh, my, my first answer, which I always say, is you have to thank Spiro Agnew. <laughs> that's, that's really when it started. Uh, and everybody publicly said the press is too liberal and we went out and got a bunch of conservative columnists and all the rest of them. Um, there's no group that is more thinner skinned than, than reporters or publishers or whatever. Um, and, and one of the reasons I got the column in the first place is just that reason. I, I, when I was a kid, uh, when the State of the Union came out, uh, people would have prepared remarks before the speech was given. And I used to think there was something wrong with that. Um, at least you ought to wait for the speech. Then uh, it's you know it's part of my view about the PR thing. People say anything, and and uh, I had one experience in the midst of a Rand Contra. Uh, we had which I wrote about endlessly, and I still remember one night Ronald Reagan made a speech in which he talked about how he hadn't known about um, how the arms were going for arms sales and hospitals. And we had just come across and written about the fact that it was a discuss at an NSC meeting with his, with his being present. And so the post <laughs> allowed me to, and this is the day when the president made a speech and we also wrote about the speech used to have a, a thing, a truth squatting speech right after the speech. We published the next day with the speech. And Ben got so hot because I, I said, he's, he's lying. <laughs> and so we put the word lie in next to Reagan on the front page of the paper. And I got a call the next day from uh, Len Garman, who was in the White House. 
fact, it was the next night, and he was half drunk. <laughs> and he said, you don't know the definition of lying. The definition of lying is saying something you know to be untrue. And Reagan may have heard it, but he didn't know it to be untrue. <laughs> um, is that always stuck with me? Uh, we did the Reagan truth squatting for about two years, and then we dropped it because people kept complaining, why don't you leave the old man alone, and all the rest of it. And then, and there was people, as you probably know, know, know more about how we were than we know about how they were. And people figured out, if you put out a statement, you write it, the Republicans are, are brilliant at putting out funny statements. I mean taking some serious issue and turning it around and making a joke about it, and it gets printed all the time. And it's generally attributed to somebody on, the, on one of the committee, campaign committee staff. So the president makes a speech and we're quoting a critical remark from some staff. But it's funny, so I get some paper. I mean, the, the, the short answer is I think most employers don't think about it. But the idea of having I started off saying, the reason I got the column is I kept going up saying, this was said, or this is happening, and we ought to write about it. And, and they would say, well, what does X think about it? I said, X doesn't know about it. Well, call him up and ask him. I said, well, how can you call up, tell somebody you just discovered X, and you'd like them to comment based on what you tell them that it says? I mean, it was bizarre. So. Uh, and that came about because I was covering the war, the, the uh, first Iraq war and then the Afghan war without going there. And I covered it by reading contracts because it's a contracted out war. And if you read the contracts, you were a month or two easily ahead of anything that was ever announced. And so you find something out in the contract, we're going to build something for the Iraqis. Or we're going to hire, well, your first early stories that we're going to hire intelligence people to work in Iraq on forward basis on intelligence. And it's first, in, you know, we were short of people and all the rest of it. And, and so an editor said to me, well, you know, what are, what are the Democrats or what are the Republicans thinking of? I said, they don't know about it. Ask them. Yeah. Hi, uh, Ben Friedman from the Ben Friedman from Cato. Um, I just want to be sort of devil's advocate for a sec. Uh, haven't we always had government by PR? You know, it's democracy. Democracy is about sales. It hasn't good uh, oversight, and for that matter, good reporting always uh, been a result of uh, somebody's political agenda, which then created institutional conflict, which reporters could then exploit. Um, and uh, it seems to me uh, the big thing that's changed is the conflicts become more partisan as opposed to more uh, inner branch. But um, if, if you could just uh, you know say uh, how things have, have gotten worse and why people can get, a, get away with lying more. I, I think it's become institutionalized. I mean, I think it's become a tactic. Uh, and I think. The other part I always use is that is during particularly the Iraq War and the Bush administration, um, the White House would leak that the president is going off in the next week to make speeches to support the war um, and give it to us or give it to the Times or somebody, um, and they write the story. And then he'd go off and spend five days making speeches, and we'd cover the speeches. Because you now cover whatever a president said. <coughs> um, I mean, you're getting all these old stories that affected me. The, the person who changed, who helped make this change, uh, was, was Mike Deaver, who was a real genius. And I was working in television, and from CBS, and I'd go into a morning meeting at CBS, and 
before Reagan came in, there used to be an 8.30 meeting at the White House for television producers, because they had to know where the president was going to appear that day, if he was going anywhere, so they could get set up. Mike Deaver turned that into today's story. And so, in the morning, um, they'd come in and say, the president is going to appear at 12.15 in the Rose Garden and talk about his crime program, and he's going to emphasize San Francisco and Chicago as areas that you know fit what he's talking about. And that was done so that the, the, the network should go to San Francisco and Chicago and shoot B-roll of that. The president would come out and make a speech for 10 minutes and, or five minutes and leave. And that'd be the story. And what Mike figured out is on the evening news, which was much more powerful then, uh, the networks had all their best correspondents covering the White House. Um, if you had a story every day, uh, you'd get on the air and people would watch it. At the end of Reagan's first year, Dave Broder wrote a column that was very incisive saying, he thought Reagan was the most disconnected president he'd ever seen. And the mail came pouring in saying, how can you say that? We see him every, you know, he was, he was talking about this that day, and he was talking about this the other day. You know, he's just busy as a little beaver. And the fact is, they knew what he did for five or ten minutes, but the rest of the day didn't know anything. And that, that became the story. And we never used to have a president slug every day. And we began to have a president slug every day. And then when he didn't do anything, he went to Camp David or yelled something. It became a story. And, and what's his name? BBC made a name for himself. Asking questions, the president going on Air Force One. And so then when Bush came in, and he wasn't that clear about it, People started saying Bush was sort of stepping on his mind. So he, you know, he didn't know really how to have uh, his way with the press. And Clinton came in, and he had four things a day, and they didn't know what to write about. And so it became that like he was confused or whatever. Uh, and and so staying on message became a characteristic of a president. We're a candidate. Now, what the hell has that got to do with anything? Excuse me, I mean, Franklin Roosevelt doing a fireside chat was a PR operation, but not like this. And he didn't do it every day. Sir? Paul Eaton, National Security Network. Uh, what are your thoughts on today's uh, civil military relations and uh, the rise of? active uh, retired general officers and admirals. Careful, Paul. <laughs> 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 um, I, I, you know, it's a new phenomenon. I, I, uh, is it better than going to work for Lockheed? I don't know. <laughs> it is. <laughs> <laughs> uh, when I was much younger, I used to go to the Pentagon every once in a while and, and go into what used to be the files that you have to file, you know, if you went to work for a corporation or something. And I, I don't know if anybody was done. I don't even know if they keep the files in. Um, so it used to be you were worried about military officers going to work for companies where they had former responsibilities or in areas where they had former responsibilities got involved in writing about these contractors who, uh, there's a new story today about you know, people don't realize that how much money we pay to provide sustenance to the, re to the troops in Iraq. I mean, it's a $2 billion a year contract. And they made a mess of it. And the com company that had it in Iraq had a, a Kuwaiti company, had the former guy in charge of working for it. and about four other people. So that was what I used to worry about. I mean, the flurry about becoming 
commentators. At least you know they've been careful. If I could follow on that, though, there, 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 it, it, you hear from some active military and some recently retired that it's not the business of the retired flags to stand up and get involved in the politics side of the house, and uh, that they did their duty and it's time to shut their mouth and go away. What do you feel about that? When I, in the year I was writing about the neutron, which was considered one of the most damaging things to American foreign policy. Admiral Radford had retired, and I was at some conference, which I thought I wouldn't show up at. And, and that's the way he introduced me, as somebody who's done more damage to American foreign policy than anybody else in recent months. Um, I, I just believe it's free speech. And you do it. I, if there is one problem I have, it is that the military has gotten this reputation of being the only people who can get things done. And uh, it's the interesting move to military people in non-military areas, just as I mean, there's a flurry about military people uh, getting an education, the field of education, because they can organize things. And, and to be honest, when I did the investigations in the 70s, 60s, um, military people were the most honest that I dealt with. Um, you come under the authority of the Center for Armed Relations Committee and you prove you're serious. I mean, they used to give me a schedule that if I went abroad, you know, the first meeting was at 10. And you quit for lunch and you see somebody in the afternoon and they take you out to dinner. And I rescheduled everything and we started at 8 and went all the way through the evening. I mean, got, once you prove you're serious, then they, they act the way they're supposed to act. Which wasn't what the State Department did. They would say whatever they thought I wanted to hear or <laughs> Fulbright wanted to hear. Etc. Uh, so I was always impressed with the military, and, I, and that's the way I feel about it. But you've got to show the serious. And I think they are a serious group of people. I think the training is terrific. I, the training I got, which is, I, I ran the Air Force ROTC unit, I mean, as a, as a student, phony officer. And then they changed it from two years to three years, and so, refused the commission and got drafted. Uh, and the two years that I was in, or at least the first six months of basic training was the greatest lesson I ever got, being pushed around by people who were really dumb but had the law on their side. <laughs> and you learned how most people live. And it was a great experience. I tried to get my kids to <laughs> I think we've got time for one more question. I know we'll just see the audience. Uh, I have one. The question is that you'd like to live in a world without nuclear weapons. We have Shoals and Kerry and Don and Kissinger endorsing that. Do you think that's made any difference or was it remarkable? Remarkable. 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 A desirable thing. I, everybody took the column I wrote today as someone was saying I, I thought nuclear weapons would end. I don't think they will. I think you can't uninvent them. Uh, they are a great deterrent. I left out of the piece which I should have used, General Cartwright, in a hearing the other day, described them as a shield. Uh, but they're not a, not a usable or offensive weapon. And, uh, I mean, I've spent a lot of time thinking about what, what I was trying to say today was the amount of money we're spending making them, quote, more usable, safer, whatever. I mean, the idea that the British are going to spend, with all their problems, going to spend $30 billion to have four submarines to go after what? I don't know. Uh, but we're going to spend probably much more. Uh, and I 
think our, our nuclear weapon posture is always going to be slightly overdone until, I hate to say it, until you have a military man as president. And it'll be like Eisenhower. It'll be the one person who can knock it down. But you need that kind of authority. 